I told somebody walking across the campus, I feel like the rapture happened and we got left behind. That, <laughs> kind of a scary moment to think that might have happened. But David's here, so I felt sure that we're okay. <laughs> Let's take a moment and uh, you pray for me that I'll teach you the truth, that the Holy Spirit will be involved in this com uh, conversation between you and me. The same Holy Spirit that breathed out the scriptures is the whole, same Holy Spirit that resides within you. And I'm going to pray really hard that he reveals what part of this teaching is for you. And you pray really hard that I'll just teach you the truth. So let's do that for each other. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, we invite you into this encounter. Uh, without you, this is a waste of time. With you, it can transform us from the inside out. We ask that you would be in the teaching and in our hearts, revealing what it is that you want for each of us. I pray that this time would be worthwhile and insightful and redeeming and gracious. And we pray these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to read to you verses 1 and 2. Last week we looked at verse 1 and we looked at eight words there. This week we're going to look at verse 2 and only look at one word there. Okay? Verse 1, chapter 1 of Ephesians, it says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Something I didn't mention last week, but does become very relevant to this teaching today on grace, is that Paul identifies himself two ways. He identifies himself as an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. He double stacks the credibility of this teaching. And what Paul is wanting you and I to know from the get-go is as we explore grace and all that is in this letter, it is important to know this is not a TED Talk from Paul. This is not a philosophy of Paul. Paul received this message from Christ Jesus himself and then adds to that statement of authority by the will of God. Both God and Jesus Christ are in Paul's teaching. Verse 2, then, where we're going to spend this morning is grace to you. The word grace is in the New Testament 131 times. 86 of them are used by Paul, which some refer to Paul as the apostle of grace. We're going to look at how to define grace, but let me give you it in a very clear, compelling way. The gospel of Jesus Christ, all that it entails is found in one word. The gospel of salvation is found in the word grace. 
And it's my understanding that most of us fully have yet to absorb its meaning. I would say as much time as I've spent on it, I get about 3% of grace's depth. Ironside, the professor, the uh, president of Dallas Seminary, just before he died, he was wheeled into one of his classrooms in a wheelchair, and he spoke of grace, and at the end, his students stood up and applauded him for his teaching on grace. And as he left in his wheelchair, he looked at the young men and said, I have only now, after 50 years, begun to understand the depth of this word. And so my fear this morning will be throughout this entire teaching that I still haven't been able to communicate its beauty, its goodness, its kindness, and its richness, and that you will leave the same people that you came in. But if by chance God answers my prayer for you, and you really do fully understand to some degree, the richness, the goodness, the kindness of grace, it will transform you from the inside out. Salvation, your salvation, begins and ends with grace. Let me say it again. Your salvation begins and ends with grace with nothing that you can do to contribute to what Christ has done for you. Period. Stick a fork in it. It is done. That's the beauty of what this word is going to ta take us to. Philip Yancey in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, says this, Grace is shockingly personal. Grace means there's nothing I can do to make God love me more and nothing I can do to make God love me less. It means that I, even I, who deserve the opposite, am invited to take my place at the table in God's family. Henry Nouwen says, God rejoices not because the problems of the world have been solved, not because all human pain and suffering has come to an end, not because thousands of people have been converted and are now praising him for his glorious goodness. No, God rejoices rejoices because one of his children who was lost has been found. Grace, at its core, at, 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 in its essence, is relational, not judicial. It is God taking the initiative to go find you, like the woman who loses the coin, the shepherd who loses a sheep, the father who loses a son, he pursues you, which is why, note, Paul says, and don't miss this, grace to you and peace from God. Grace is God's initiative, his relational initiative to go pursue you, and it's his graciousness that finds you. There's a story of a, of, of a mother in Brazil whose daughter leaves the village for the big city. And word reaches back to her that her daughter has become a prostitute in that city. And the mom goes to the city and she visits one brothel after another brothel after another brothel and discovers the, the nightmarishness of her daughter's life. Exploited, used, thrown away. And in one of the brothels she doesn't find her daughter, but leaves a note and it says this, whatever you've done, whatever you become, it doesn't matter. Please come home. Love mom. And the daughter that evening came into the brothel and saw the note and did what her mom asked her to do. She went home. Grace calls you and I to go home. Grace is God's invitation at the sinfulness of our life, and he invites us to come home, and he ends the note with love God.
So there's three questions we're going to look at quickly this morning. They're in your bulletin. The three questions I want to answer for you are these. Number one, what does the word grace mean? I guarantee you, you do not fully understand it, as Ironside said after 50 years of teaching at a seminary. Number two, what's grace and all about? What's the big deal of grace? And number three, how does grace impact my life and your life and our life? So question number one, when Paul says in verse two, the beginning of it, three words, grace to you, here is what grace means. I'm going to give you several. You get to pick which one. None of them captures it all. Number one is this, grace is favor, unmerited favor. It's beautiful kindness. Grace is, this is my favorite, God's active saving goodness. Jerry Petalon and I talked about this at length this week. It's not God's saving goodness, or it's not just God's active goodness, it's God's active saving goodness. Here's a third definition. God's act of kindness to allow the condemned sinner to become a beloved child. God's act of kindness to allow the condemned sinner, which you and I are, to become the beloved child. Some of you grew up with grace. This might help those of you who like acrostics, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. The reason we don't, and, I, and I've tried to figure this out, why don't we grasp the beauty and the elegance and the kindness of grace. Why don't we really fully get it? And one of the reasons we don't fully get it is because we live in a society where you give to get, work to earn, you get what you deserve. That's the culture we live in. And so we come into this auditorium with that same mentality. You get what you, you give what you get, you, you work and earn, you get what you deserve. And yet this word grace was used before Paul and the scriptures of, of, a, of a God or an emperor who, who, who gives favor to inferior people. It, it's this beautiful favor that's bestowed. But one of the deeper truths in this concept of grace is to fully understand that grace is Follow me, who God is. It is his nature to be gracious. Your God, your Father, is by his very nature. You don't have to twist his arm to give you grace. He gives you grace freely, overwhelmingly, unjustly. He is a gracious God. You say, where? I'll give you some. Exodus 34, 6 through 7, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Old Testament. Psalm 111, 4, the Lord is gracious and compassionate. Nehemiah 9, 17, but thou art a God of forgiveness, gracious and compassionate. Jonah 4, 2, I know that thou art gracious and compassionate, God. In describing Jesus, John 1, 16, for from his fullness, Jesus, we have received grace upon grace. 1 Peter 5, 10, and after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, Revelation 22, 21, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. The scriptures at the core, the core of salvation, the very reason that you are saved has nothing to do with you and everything to do with Jesus. We'll get to what that means. 
But that's a big truth for some of us. It was for my grandmother. I have this residue within me of religion. My grandmother feared God. And I grew up a little while with my grandmother and I absorbed her fear of God. You didn't do anything wrong. One thing wrong and you're checked off the list. And I remember the fear in her. I mean, she loved Jesus, but somehow the law, uh, religion, duty overwhelmed the, the relationship she could have. She knew very little of, of grace. And I, I, still, I, I still cringe when, when I come into this room of grace because I feel so unworthy of it. And the truth is I am unworthy of it. But the law sucks me in, religion sucks me in, and I know some of you with 50 years of church, church have been sucked in to religion and law. My wife rescued a dog named Cowboy, a beautiful lab, beaten from the very get-go by a master who wanted this dog to be a prize Labrador, uh, not a Labrador, a retriever, and, and, and in that experience of training him, this Poor dog, I don't know what his problem is, but he doesn't learn quick, I will, know, I will tell you that. And he was beaten. I mean, I'm going to guess beaten daily. And in fact, my wife met the owner of the dog on his way up to the hills outside of Williams to shoot the dog. And my wife convinced him not to shoot the dog and she'll take that dog. We've had that dog a year. And that dog is still, after a year of grace and love and kindness, still cowards at a loud voice. Still goes to the back of where he sleeps. And some of you still allow the law and religion to destroy the joy that grace can give you. That's why it's a beautiful word. Do you remember in, uh, in math that sign? Here, I'm going to show it to you. Remember this sign in math? How many? Raise your hand if you don't have to say it out loud. How many of you remember that? Okay, for those of you who didn't get to algebra, like me, this means greater than. It's a sign in math. You, most of us know equal. This means greater than. What it means is that which is on the left mathematically is greater than that which is on the right. Change that symbol the other way, and that means now what is on the left is less than that which is on the right. You get it? So let me give you a number. Nine, the number nine, is a bigger number than the number three. And if you think three is bigger than nine, let's exchange $100 bills real quick, all right? <laughs> you and I. I'll give you three, you give me nine. But 9 is smaller than 12. Now let me give you a symbol. Let's go with a little bit of algebra. G is greater than S. Grace is greater than sin. That is a big big truth. I don't care what your sin is. I don't care what your addiction was. I don't care how many times you were married. I don't care what kind of addictions you had. I don't know. I don't care how many times you were in a federal penitentiary. I don't care your story. I don't care what that long list of sin is. Grace is bigger, larger than your sin. Some of you live with this equation. Some of you still believe that your past is bigger than your future. And it is destroying the very fabric of what your life can be. And so grace is bigger than sin. It's bigger than your past. It's bigger than your choice. It's bigger than your religion. It's bigger than your secrets. That's, that's the truth. Spurgeon was going home, the great preacher in the uh, 1800s and was struggling with depression and all of a sudden God revealed to him 2 Corinthians 12, 9, which says this, my grace is sufficient for thee. And Spurgeon writes in his letters that he broke out laughing. He laughed. 
he laughed all the way home. And as he laughed all the way home, it was, he, he penned these words. When he fully understood that my grace is sufficient for, for thee, he understood the, the dilemma of a little fish that's very thirsty and is troubled about drinking the river dry. A little fish in a river afraid that he's going to drink the river dry. Spurgeon went on to say it's like a mouse who finds themselves in the grain silos of Joseph after seven years of harvest. All of the silos of grain and the mouse is afraid it's going to starve to death. Spurgeon went on to say it's like a man who reaches the top of a mountain and having reached the top of the mountain is afraid that he's going to consume all of the oxygen in the air. Spurgeon's point is you cannot exhaust his grace. It is a river that flows. It is a grain silo that's full. It is the air above the mountain. It is rich in every way. So, at least you doubt me, let me read to you some verses. John 1.16 says this, And from his fullness we have received grace upon grace. That's how John introduces Jesus. He doesn't just introduce Jesus as grace, it's grace upon grace. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, we'll get there eventually, says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. Let me say it again. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is a gift, a gift, a gift, not a wager of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in him. Romans eleven six. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. The moment you bring grace to the equation, you must eliminate works. Hebrews 4.16, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Now here's where it gets even prettier. Grace in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, in the Septuagint, has the meaning to stoop down. The, the imagery in the Old Testament of grace is one who stoops down for somebody else. Now, what is that all about? Where, where does all that come into play in the New Testament? This concept of God's grace is found in Philippians chapter 2, where we discover that God emptied himself and came down, stooped down to rescue us. There's grace. The, the beauty of John 1, the word became flesh and pitched his tent, stooped down. In John chapter 8, a woman's caught in adultery and Jesus stoops down and writes in the sand. In John chapter 13, Jesus stoops down and washes the disciples' feet. In John chapter 18, Jesus stoops down and prays. God is a God who stoops down for you. I mean, we could just sit there for a moment. If you know anything about English tradition, you know that when you walk into the presence of the queen or a king, that you come forward to them and you never turn your back on them. 
You, you take six, eight, 12 steps back before you can turn to leave. At least you turn your back. And the last thing I guarantee any of you has ever seen in English history is a king or a queen to stoop down and wash someone's feet. But grace, grace changes the story. So what's the big deal about grace? Let me put it in a chart. Let me, let, me, let me give it to you this way. Let me try to distinguish between uh, religion and grace. Let me try to help you understand that I love my grandma, Henrietta Davis. She lived on the left and never could celebrate the right. And some of you are on the left. Some of you are on the right. Most of us are in the middle somewhere. So when you look at the key words, I just want to do a comparison before, for you. Religion, by its very nature, is all about doing. So if you think of your faith story as doing, I do devotions, I do prayer, I do service, I do good things, I don't go to the bar, I don't do this, if you're faith is made up of doing. So somehow if you do enough, God will enter your story. If you do enough, somehow he will welcome you into heaven. If you do enough, somehow Jesus' death on the cross is sufficient. You do not understand grace because grace by its very definition is not do but done. Jesus on the cross said it is finished. It's done. We're going to get to the implications of that. When you look at the focus, religion is all about the outside. It's about what we wear. You get into churches that you have to wear a certain thing. You got to wear a suit. You got to wear a tie. You got to, you got to wear an outfit. You got to go to a church on a certain day. You got to go to church four days a week. It's all about external and, and, and the evaluation is on the external. But in grace, it's all about the interior. It's about your heart. It's the condition of your heart. It's the purity of your temple. It's where the Holy Spirit resides. Because in grace, the belief is that we will become what's on the inside. When you look at the foundation of religion, it all has to do with rules or laws. And some of you are checking it off daily, or you're checking off on other people, or you're checking it off on me. Is Bill following the rules? What I want you to hear this morning is grace is about relationship. Let me say it again, it's not about rules. Some of you are so worried about holding on to the rules and you're walking through the museum reading the instruction and you're missing the beautiful pictures that are there for you to see because you're all caught up here. And, you, and because your hands are here, you cannot embrace Jesus here and you know nothing of what it means to have this meaningful relationship with a gracious Lord. Some of you have never experienced that. Some of you have never freed. Some of you are still working your way up to some standard whereby God reaches out to you. You've been doing it for 50 years and you're exhausted. What's the motivation in religion? It's all about avoiding shame. What's the motivation in grace? It's all about gratitude. When you fully understand that it's all been done for you by him, your response is not shame, but gratitude. You don't hide your secrets, you reveal them. The past is something to learn, not something to hide from. And there's just this incredible beauty that when you grasp the richness that God took the initiative to enter your story, and he entered your story because he loved you, then you come out of that and you're, you're grateful. What's the feeling? If you live your life fear and fear or frustration, uh, you may be living on the left side of the chart. 
I went in this week again for another piece of skin to be cut off. And there is always that moment where you go, I hope he doesn't say, uh-oh. And there is that moment when you find yourself in those precarious situations that you have to ask yourself, or it will come, if I die, do I get into heaven? I mean, if, 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 if I die, what becomes of my eternity? And some of you, if you were diagnosed with cancer and were about to die, would be fearful and wonder if God is going to accept you in, and if that is your response to those kind of moments, then you're living in fear. But in grace, you're free. In grace, you can go and you don't have to... You, you, that's why Paul, I mean, the writer of Hebrews, we, we don't go into the throne room of grace covered. We're not fearful. We, we jump on, on, on the Father's lap. And we, and we get embraced by the Father and we go, as, as the author says, we go boldly because it had nothing to do with us. It never did. It was always about Jesus. There's something in us that wants to earn our salvation, and it's not to be earned. And there's something in us that runs scared. I think it's the evil one who tempts us not to go into the presence of a holy father that embraces us based on our, our sinfulness, but points and pokes his finger in our chest. Somehow we don't get this. And, I, and I've come to the deep conclusion, it's not because we're really stupid, it's because we're up against a very incredible enemy who will do everything to get you not to hear what I'm trying to say to you this morning. Because it's through the scriptures it's all the way through the scriptures, this concept of grace, and yet some of you have yet to understand it. You know the story of the prodigal son. We've covered it a hundred times. You've learned it a thousand times. But somehow your past causes you not to go home. And yet the prodigal son, after all of the prostitution and all of the money and all of the inheritance being spoiled and after all of the drunkenness and living with the pigs, comes to his senses and he goes to the father. And as he goes to the father, while he's still a long way off, the father sees him and runs to him. And when he gets to him, he doesn't point poke his finger in his chest and says, you spent all of my money. You slept with women. You were drunk all the time. He doesn't extend a cold shoulder to the son. He doesn't lecture the son. He doesn't turn his back on the son. Jesus is telling us who the father is. He comes and he embraces the son. Follow the story in Luke 5. He tackles his son to the ground. He kisses his son. And his son has done nothing but come back home. And you miss it. And his father doesn't start, stop with the hugging. He calls the servant and says, get a robe and get sandals and get a, get a ring and kill the fatted calf and let's have a feast. Not because he's going to do something between the hug and the feast. It's because of the Father's grace. Jesus is trying to get you and I to see that we serve a righteous God, but one who is gracious and good and kind. Jesus encounters a woman who's been married five times. In the heat of the day, she goes to a well, and Jesus responds to her brokenness with grace. Jesus sees in Mark 2 a man lowered before him that's been a paralytic all of his life. He's done nothing. And Jesus, by being lowered in front of him, forgives the man of all of his sin. And the man did nothing. He didn't go to church. He didn't read his Bible. He was paralyzed. 
And not only could he leave walking, but he left forgiven. In Luke 23, the thief on the cross, this guy that has lived his whole life in decadence, all of his life, is nailed to a cross and he can do nothing. He's nailed to a cross. There's no works he can do. He's nailed to a cross and Jesus by grace forgives him. I've read from this book before, I'll read it again, The Rag Muffin Gospel. For those, those of us who grew up with grandmothers highly religious and fearful of God. Brennan Manning says this, because salvation is by grace through faith, I believe among the countless number of people standing in front of the throne <laughs> and in front of the Lamb, dressed in white robes, holding palms in their hands, Revelation 7, 9, I shall see the prostitute from Kit Kat Ranch in Carson City, Nevada, who tearfully told me that she could find no other employment to support her two-year-old son. I shall see the woman who had an abortion and is haunted by guilt and remorse, but did her be best she could to face the grueling alternatives. The businessman besieged with debt, who sold his integrity in a series of desperate transactions, the in insecure clergyman who addicted to being liked, who never challenged his people from the pulpit and longed for unconditional love, the sexually abused teen molested by someone else and is now selling his body on the street, who falls asleep each night after his last trick and whispers the name of an unknown God he's learned about in Sunday school, the deathbed convert who for decades had his cake and ate it too, broke every law of God and man, wallowed in lust and raped the earth, standing in front and I ask myself, but how? And then the voice says, they have been washed in the blood of the lamb. They are, there we are the multitude so, who wanted to be faithful, who at times got defeated, soiled by life, bested by trials, wearing the bloody garment of life's tribulation, but through it all we clung to faith. My friends, this is not, a, not good news to you. If this is not good news to you, you have never understood the gospel of peace and the gospel of grace. Third question, much shorter answer than the other two. So what's grace's impact on my life? What's grace's impact on your life? Um, let me give it to you simply. Two things. When you understand God's grace, and experience it, you will become gracious people. I will never understand why it is that a Christian community who lives under the theology and the theme of grace fully accepted, how we could be self-righteous in any way, why we would be the first to judge, the first to criticize, the first to exclude, we, we are to be gracious people. We are to be the ones who reach us out first. I, ha I have a buddy this week, a believer in Hollywood, uh, in the industry, who lives on the East Coast, West Coast, and when he's on the West Coast, he lives in a tiny house because he's only out at his office one week out of a month and every morning this last week he woke up and had no water in his shower and walked outside and there he discovered some homeless man had unhooked his hose and used the water to wash himself. And every day my buddy got up and reattached the hose three days in a row, no shower early, waiting for the tank to be refilled. 
And on the fourth day, rather than call the police, took a hose, split it, attached one to his tiny home, and one to the man who needed to take a shower. That's grace. We um, are to be people that are doing kind and good to someone who doesn't deserve it or could never earn it. Spurgeon and Parker with two great preachers in the 1800s in, uh, in London. Both had large churches. Spurgeon's church, if you follow them, had 12,000 people at the temple. Parker had mentioned to somebody the terrible condition that the orphan orphans were prior to getting to Spurgeon's orphanages. But it was reported to Spurgeon that Parker said the terrible condition that the orphans were in, in his orphanage. And so Spurgeon got up on Sunday morning to a crowd of 12,000 people and berated Parker for having such, said such a terrible thing that was untrue. And it made the newspapers in London and everybody the next week went to Parker's church to see how he would respond to Spurgeon's derogatory statements of him. That morning, Parker got up and he said to the congregation, I hear Spurgeon is not in the pulpit today. We're going to take an offering for the orphanage. And the ushers went about collecting not one full offering, but three full offerings. That week, Spurgeon knocked on Parker's pastor's office door. Parker opened the door, and Spurgeon said this to him. You know, Parker, you have practiced grace on me. You have given me not what I deserved. You have given me what I needed. That's the implications of grace. That you demonstrate your appreciation for what you've been given to those around you. We are to be vehicles, vessels, vines, people, apparatuses, hoses of grace. Let me give you the other benefit. It's this, joy. Do you know that the word joy and the word grace come from the same root word? Follow that. Grace and joy have a root meaning. Where are you going, Bill? It's this, that when you experience grace, you will inadvertently experience joy. When you experience grace, you will inadvertently experience thankfulness. And in closing, to the degree that you don't experience joy or thankfulness is the degree that you don't understand grace yet. I mean, if you get home this afternoon and somebody has sent you a check for $10 million just because of you, I guarantee you, you would feel something, wouldn't you? Come on. Truth, $10 million, you cash it, you get the money, you deposit it, you feel something. That would be called joy. That would be called thankfulness. And so Jesus comes into our life and he offers us eternal life. We are called children of God. We are the beloved. We climb onto his lap. We're guaranteed eternity with him. And you know what we give back? Yeah, okay. All right. That's all right. It's a nice theological truth. Unmerited grace, unmerited favor. 
You got to swim in that word. You got to swim in it. If the world should know anything about us, it should label us as gracious. It is the nature of God and it should be our nature because God dwells in us. That's why in the end of John Newton's life, the, the slave trader who was the captain of ships where half the people that were transported across the Atlantic died, who was a drunkard, a womanizer, a thief, a killer, comes to this deep faith in God and understands the grace of God and therefore as a result of his tragic evil life, writes the hymn. Amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. There is a man who knew how evil he was. And how gracious God was to forgive him of that. And a Savior who died on a cross whose last words were, it is finished. And so for those of you who are still trying to work your level up of goodness so God will reach down and grab you, stop it. Stop working. Stop being religious. And by faith, accept the free gift to be forgiven of your entire past, no matter how evil it is, and it is an unjust act in many ways to be forgiven of all. For, for John Newton, he understood how, how unjust grace was. That's why he called it amazing grace. And if you think God's grace to you because you're such a good person is only not really amazing, it's, it's just grace, then you don't understand how evil you are. You don't know what it means with, with, that all of our righteousness is but filthy rags. So no matter who you are in this room, until you come to the foot of the cross and believe that what Jesus did on the cross is sufficient for you to be called the child of God, beloved, forgiven, until you come to the foot of the cross with nothing in your hands but your sinfulness, You don't yet get it. And you know how I know some of you don't get it? Because I see so little joy, so little thankfulness that a gracious God would come to earth to rescue you and rescue me. And so when you're in that hospital room about to die, you don't have to live in fear that you did it good enough because Jesus did do it good enough. And God is a compassionate, gracious, overwhelmingly loving God. Not the God of my grandmother, the God of the New Testament, not, not just of the New Testament of the entire scriptures. And so I ask you this week, do me a favor. There'll be devotions every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, on this concept of grace. There'll be key quotes every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, this week. Read them. There will be an audio of this sermon. Listen to it again. There'll be a video of the sermon. Listen to it again. There'll be a transcript of the sermon. Read it again. Do what you have to do to bathe. Because I will tell you this, it took me an entire week with a very dear friend named Jerry Petalon who pounded in me the depth of this word. Not just academically, but emotionally. That I am forgiven And I brought nothing. I could do nothing, which is why it's so gracious. It is why I want people to know Jesus. That's why the gospel is good news. And so we look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 2. And my fear is an hour from now you'll forget grace to you. To you. You don't pursue it. You don't gain it. 
You don't work your way to it. You don't climb high enough. It comes to you by a God who is by nature compassionate, kind, and loving. And when that gets here, not here, when it gets here, you will do more about missions. And you will look at your neighborhood differently and you'll look at your work differently and you'll look at these people differently. And you know what? In the end, people will talk about you differently because you'll be the last to judge and the first to give because that's the graciousness of your father. And it should be the definition of this church and who we are. People should find grace first here. We got a whole book to go through we got a lot of walking to do. But Paul starts his letter with grace. He ends his letter with grace. Because that's where the Christian life begins and ends with grace. If you choose to take communion... Come forward, take the elements, go back, hold them. The group is going to sing a song while you sit quietly. And then at the end of the song, we'll partake of them together. Thanks, Doc. Broken within, overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Every week, we take communion. And I have people say to me, is it becoming a ritual? And I say, I hope not.
because it represents grace. God stooping down to earth to find you and me and to die on a cross. Take eat in remembrance of him. And the cup, Hebrews says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. John looked at Jesus and says, there is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It is in Christ's shedding of his blood on the cross that we find forgiveness. Salvation begins and ends with Jesus. Take drink in remembrance of him. If you've been stuck like my grandma, Henrietta Davis, who I love, and it is in heaven, I know. We had many talks. And you've been stuck in religion, or in duty, or in law, or trying to perform, or get good enough, I invite you to put your faith in Jesus Christ this morning for the forgiveness of your sins. And if you've never been baptized, I invite you to be baptized this morning. And if you need prayer, I invite you to go and have some wonderful people pray in the corner. And if you need to talk to me and debate me and argue with me, I would love it, okay? Right here, I'm here for you. I'll put a mask on and you can argue with me and we'll just sit and study the scriptures together. Um, I'm gonna pray, the group is gonna sing. You're invited to sit and pray. You're invited to talk with each other. You're invited to go to the cafe. You're invited to mingle. Uh, there's a lot of invitations. The time will be yours. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I continue to pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you would take your scriptures and carry them into our hearts. And I pray for anyone in this room who's still in the pig pen, who, who, who's never been told there's a God who will run to him, not away from him, to her, not away from her. Who's, who's caught up in shame and guilt and dirtiness and filth and exploitation and everything about them. Father, I pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit that they might put their faith in Jesus Christ and be as white as snow and stand at the throne and worship the one who did it all. And may they live each day of their life full of joy and thankfulness greater than the joy and thankfulness they would have if they were given $10 million. May we be gracious people. Father, we thank you, we glorify you, we, we praise you for your grace. Jesus, we thank you are, that you are grace upon grace. And we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen and amen. Have a great day. Oh, what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Sing Christ is